today we are interviewing Mr. Sunil Disanayaka, the Director General of the BMICH and the former Chairman of Sri Lanka uh, Tourism and Hotel Management. Uh, hello Mr. Disanayaka. Hello. Uh, we are very pleased to have you on our show. Thank you. And I would like uh, to hear from you how the hotel school as it started and now it has progressed very, very far, especially under your tenure. Can you briefly tell us how it started and how it came up to now? Please. Thank you, Chanaka. Thank you for inviting me for this conversation. Yes, to answer your question, the Ceylon Hotel School first started operations in 1966 when tourism was being structured as a structured uh, industry in the country. Uh, we first commenced operations at uh, Hotel Samudra, which was formerly known as the Colombo Club, the oval shaped building in front of Taj Samudra. And then for, we had to give way to the Taj Samudra construction. So we shifted out of there to different locations. And finally, in the year 2001, I think, or 2002, we came to our own building where we are currently located at the opposite Cinnamon Grand. Uh, in 2005, with the new Tourism Act coming into force, the name changed to Sri Lanka Institute of Tourism and Hotel Management. Uh, one of the significant, actually, uh, it started with aid from the International Labour Organization, where the ILO funded the operations, the equipment, and also the principals, teaching faculty, curriculum development, everything was funded as a grant by the ILO at the time. And this arrangement went on for many years, I think somewhere around till 1975 or 76. And then again, it, uh, they commenced in 79 and went on till about 1982. By then we had, we became self-sufficient, we had our own buildings, we had our own equipment, we had our own teaching faculty and it's progressing very well uh, and a significant feature is that none of those people who have passed out from the then Ceylon Hotel School and currently the Sri Lanka Institute of Tourism and Hotel Management is, is not unemployed. Everybody, every single person is employed. From the day they pass out, they get uh, employed and uh, we have not been closed for a single day for student unrest. Yeah unlike in many other uh, seats of uh, learning in the higher education uh, sector. Uh, right now, initially what was your intake and how, how many has it come to now? Yeah. In, uh, in the 60s and early 70s, we had only two types of courses. We had the three-year diploma, which was a residential course and there were three batches at any given time of about 30 students in each batch, that was about 90 and every year about 30 graduates came out who joined the industry as management trainees. And then we also ran the craft courses which were six months to give a specific uh, competence uh, uh, to perform various tasks as waiters, room boys, cooks and receptionists. That was the craft course. The diploma was for the management. Uh, and subsequently it has the, we expanded and uh, when I became chairman in 2015 November under the current minister honorable John Namarathunga, uh, our intake output was about 2500 and when I relinquished my position in November 2015 after my term ended, sorry November 2018, we had gone up to 7200 that was to cater to the head count or the human resources requirements in the expanding tourism industry. Uh, and now what uh, disciplines do you all cover now? Uh, we have about five to six different courses. We have two diploma programs. One is the four-year diploma and the other is the three-year diploma. Four-year diploma has a uh, uh, significant amount of industrial training whereas the three-year diploma is limited to about six months of industrial training during the program. Then we also have the craft course that is the shorter duration to give different skills and then we have the certificate course which leads to the four-year diploma. Uh, and we also introduced a new program called the apprenticeship course uh, that's just for one month for fresh school leavers even without all levels 
we take them on and give them the basic skills, very basic understanding. Mm -hmm. If I were to use the word 80-20, uh, we teach them 20% of what they do, 80% uh, of the time on a shift, mm -hmm. work shift, right. as trainees. So as soon as we finish this one month course, we in, uh, connect them with the hotels and the hotels take them on as trainees and give them more in-depth training. And then over a period of time, they become seasoned, whatever tasks they are performing in the different departments. And if you have been apprenticeship with us at SLITHM, you could re rejoin for more formal education later on where we give exemptions. And uh, this way from 2015 December to 2018 November, we have put out about 4,000 uh, people at uh, very task oriented mm -hmm. levels. The tourism industry, we did a data analysis when I first took over in 2015 to see what is the headcount requirement, what is the human resources requirement for the industry. At that time, there were 135,000 direct employees in the industry and we estimated by 2020 with the expansion of the industry by way of new hotels and expansion by way of more rooms for the existing hotels and then catering to the natural attrition of people going abroad for employment and mm -hmm. leaving the industry. We found that we needed 12,000 employees per year between 2015 to 2020, which would take the requirement up to about 245,000. So it was about 100,000 people more than 2015 that we would have in the industry in 20. 20, which was about 12,000 per annum. So the SLITHM, which is the Sri Lanka Institute of Tourism and Hotel Management, would put out about 60% of that requirement, 60 to 70%. And the balance 30% by the hotels themselves, their own training, as well as the private hotel schools would mm -hmm. cater to the balance. So that's how we bridge the requirement. Right. Now, out of this 12,000, we estimated 85% would be at entry level. That is people to, uh, to work as waiters, cooks, room boys, receptionists, that kind of work. 15, sorry, 10% at supervisory and 5% at management. So that's the structure and that's how we are geared. You're training them at, on those proportions? On those proportions. Yeah, one thing I would like to do now, the training once they're qualified from here, mm -hmm. uh, they are, you know, we have a large amount of people who migrate for employment. Yes. How is the acceptance of this certificate for them there overseas? It's excellent actually. Our Sri Lanka Institute of Tourism and Hotel Management has been recognized in many parts of the world, especially in the Middle East, where most of our students, former students are employed both at lower levels and at uh, senior levels. For example, I was the director of training at the Ramad Hotel in Dubai from 1988 to 1990, being an expat. And we have similarly very senior people in the industry in the Middle East, then Australia and Canada and also the UK and Germany. Now, in my batch, I am alumni of the hotel school. I passed out in 1971. I was in the sixth batch. Uh, we had 28 of us in the batch. Only six of us are in Sri Lanka. All the 22 others. Very gainfully employed uh, abroad. Overseas. They have migrated or they are, most of them, everybody has migrated at that time. Uh, so, it's, uh, uh, we are very well recognized. Uh, once someone has graduated and he wants to uh, continue his higher education, say mm -hmm. go for a master's, mm -hmm. uh, the qualifications, do you all provide those facilities? Are you all affiliated to? Not those? at the moment. Right. But uh, you can go abroad and enter a university. Right. abroad which offers masters and there are affiliated universities also right. in Sri Lanka now offering that. Yes. But the SLITHM is also planning a bachelor's degree. Right. Uh, we, before I rel relinquish my role, we had outlined a curriculum for a four-year bachelor's uh, degree, honours degree in right. hospitality management. Uh, the, what you are saying is that the qualification written here mm -hmm. is can be used as the basis for their higher education. Yes. yes. That is Special, more than sufficient. More, yeah, most universities give exemptions. Right. But if it's a four-year degree, they might say you can do in three years. Right. And give exemption for 
one year. One year. But it's uh, most people who graduate go straight into employment right. and uh, gain experience. Uh, I'm not sure why, but uh, I have found that most of our graduates uh, prefer to keep working than go for further Study, education. education you know. Perhaps because it's a uh, hotel life for all the rosy outlook is more hectic than it seems. Yeah. Probably yeah. they have lesser time yeah. or something like that. Yeah, because uh, I think it's an industry where we work when others are on holiday. Yes, <laughs> so I think very true. It's not very attractive it's now. No. In the old days it was very attractive, but we are trying to make it attractive as much as possible b simply because there are lots of other professions hmm. that are available now than it was 40 years ago, for example, when right. the industry first started on a structured basis where you have regular working hours and, you know, hmm. uh, stuff like that. So we have done a lot of awareness campaigns also during my tenure around the country. We have 11 campuses. When I took over, we had only six main campuses in Colombo, Kandy, uh, Kurunagala, Anuradhapura, Bandaravela, Ratnapura and Kogala, seven. Hmm. But we expanded in Hamba. We came up with campuses in Hambantota, in uh, Pasikuda, and in Jaffna, so that we Cover have the a greater reach, and also Polon Naru, uh, so that we have a greater reach. reach. Uh, how is the response from the outstation? How are those children coming in? Actually, for it's very good. Like oh, I said, okay. we created a lot of awareness. Uh, we went to schools. We continue to do that. Hmm. Uh, we educate the teachers, we educate the parents and the students themselves on the prospects and career paths available, available in, in the industry. hotel industry. Also during school holidays, we encourage, we took children to schools in their villages. Uh, sorry, from the uh, schools to hotels in their the community, community. Uh, on uh, familiarization trips right. or parents, teachers and students so that they can see for themselves what exactly is happening. So that would have given a very positive outlook for the prospective student who wanted to join the industry. Yes. Because say, every industry has some sort of stigma Neg in this country. Negativity. Negativity. Uh, you know? Another factor is the female uh, intake. Yes. Uh, it was also down but now it has increased again because of the awareness that we have created. And I think it's the wrong, it's a myth that the hotel industry is different to other industries. But when you actually start working, there is no issue. Uh, in Colombo, the city hotels provide a com uh, transport to female staff right to the doorstep after the night shift at 10 o'clock. And uh, the hotels out of Colombo provide accommodation and a different accommodation for females, different accommodation for males. And most of them have governesses Mm. to look after the female accommodation. female accommodation. So it's quite very safe. And uh, I have not heard of a single incident where a female hotel employee has been targeted or has been subjected to any type of uh, harassment or anything like that. So it's most a myth actually. And it's uh, quite a good uh, record for... It is. For and I think now. this myth has come, to be very frank, primarily due to our female population, some of them, not everybody, a minority, who are employed in the Middle East. Uh, we will go in for a short break now and we will be back again with Mrs. Sunil Dishanayake in a few moments. Come back. We will now continue our interview with Mr. Sunil Disanayake. Uh, Mr. Disanayake, uh, what I would like clarification of is uh, actually the situation of the female staff in the industry because there is quite a myth about uh, you know it's not being a safe place for them. Uh, what would you say about that? Yeah. Yes, Chanaka. Now, I have been in the industry for 44 years in my work life, and I have not come across a single situation not to my knowledge at least, where female employees have been subjected to any type of incident or any type of harassment in the hotel industry. Uh, I think it's a myth more than a reality. 
and the hotels also take extra precautions to provide for the safety of the female staff. The, uh, the city hotels provide uh, transport after the night shift finishes at 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. up to the doorstep. And hotels out of Colombo provide very good accommodation with also providing, the, providing a services of a governess to look after the female employees. So they are very well taken care of. Probably this myth may have come about due to some incidents that may have been reported in our newspapers uh, in the Middle East where our female employees who are working as say domestic aides uh, may have been subjected to various forms of situations and incidents. So the myth may have been created due to those that uh, even here in Sri Lanka, if you are working in a hotel, for example, uh, this is the situation. Even in the Middle East, I must say, we have, I think, more females, Sri Lankan females working in Middle Eastern hotels than in Sri Lanka. Right. Uh, I myself have been working in Dubai in the industry. And uh, even there, the females have not been, to my knowledge, has been subjected to any form of harassment in the hotel industry. Oh. It could be elsewhere, maybe in the domestic sector but definitely not in the hotel industry. Right, no, that is very encouraging to know because I'm sure a lot of people get reassured once they yes. hear the real truth, yes. you know, rather than sticking to which. Now, uh, we, our level of uh, training is quite high. It's obvious yes. from, we see the differences yes. every day. Uh, how is the market or the opportunity here for foreign students? Actually, we at SLITHM, during the last two years, we aggressively started promoting. And one way did, we did that was through the SARC countries. Mm -hmm. We invited the SARC countries to send uh, students on uh, scholarship where we give them free tuition and accommodation. Of course, the affair has to be met by the uh, home country. So right now, actually, we have two students one from Nepal and another from, uh, I can't remember exactly which country, one of the SARC countries, following our three-year diploma course. Myanmar, I think it's mm. Myanmar. Uh, following our three-year diploma course. And they are resident in our training hotel and they are following our courses. So we want to first start promoting SLITHM within the region and then see, go for a student, our plans were to then go for a student exchange. Like if we take a student from a particular country, then they also in return reciprocate by taking our students right. uh, for that same duration or for the number of students. Uh, this uh, Now there will also a large number of uh, Middle East returnees who come yes. with added experience after the years yes. with this being the base. Yes. Now how do they fit back into the industry? Also with them coming back and your train is going out. Is there excess of staff or is there a still shortage or do we meet the requirement? Yeah, like I said, I don't think, again, it's a myth that people are saying that there is a shortage. Right. Like I said, the industry needs 12,000 at the year, moment, year. Every, every year. Out of that 12,000 also, hotels don't fill all their vacancies. This 12,000 is at the optimum. Right. If you take the reality, it could be even 6,000, 50% of that. That is because the there are two types of uh, employees in a hotel. The co-employees, irrespective of your business volumes or occupancy levels, you need that amount of staff. Yes, then the second category of staff are required based on the occupancy okay. and business levels. Say, for example, the waiters and the room, primarily the room boys. Those are based on occupancy yes. levels. So, if a hotel is experiencing low occupancy, then they also would they won't re recruit all the cadre that they would uh, require and uh, people coming back is good because they bring in a lot of exposure and experience back to the industry in Sri Lanka and I think it's good people go out stay there for two three years and then they come back and I think our hotels also must do a lot of effort in promoting Sri Lankans to return we don't do that. Right. When I was the general manager at the Kingsbury about four years ago, I was on holiday in Dubai and I took it upon myself through my contacts, ask people to come to the hotel where I'm staying through Lanka Lions and all these 
clubs. We took a, uh, in the lobby, we right. met Sri Lankans who said they would like to come back. And I think for the Kingsbury, we hired about two or three people. So like that, if hotels do a concentrated effort to have career days or open days in cities in the Middle East and say, why don't you come back? If you come back, these are the positions that are on offer and this is how much you can earn. earn there yes. are lots of people who want to come back. They don't want to come without having another job, taking the risk of coming here and that then looking acceptable. for a job. Yes. Now, if you take the earning capacity, uh, they, uh, the people in the Middle East versus Sri Lanka, our people in Sri Lanka also earn as much as one would earn in a Middle yes. Eastern country. Okay. If you take the example of Dubai, uh, I think today a waiter might get about 100,000 uh, dirhams, 1,000 dirhams as the basic pay. Right. That's about, say, according to the current exchange rates, it might be about 44, 45 or 48,000 rupees for a month. Okay. Then our service charges averages about 35,000 to 30,000 rupees per month. So on top of your salary of about 15,000, you get the service charge. So that's about 35 plus 15 is about 50,000. Uh, plus, of course, the benefit of staying at home. Most hotels provide accommodation out, out of Colombo. Mm -hmm. So in the Middle East also, see in Dubai, you earn almost the same. I know one city hotel today, last month, they paid 55,000 rupees service charge. So which is attractive. But most people out there don't know that. That back home you can earn Almost as much as, as you as earn well. there. So one person who came to see me to the hotel in Dubai told me, I want to go back home. I said, why? Uh, but I said, you have been here only for six months. But every Friday, Friday is the holiday in the Middle like East. This. Every Friday I have to recite Kavi to my son on the phone for three hours. Because he is missing me. Right. You know, so I said, why don't you come back? You can earn as much or more <laughs> uh, at home at and home. you don't have to suffer like this. Yes. Mentally and you know, yes, emotionally. And rest of the family suffers. Yeah, so well. my message to hoteliers is invest money in people, which means advertising the fact abroad that when you come back to Sri Lanka also, you can earn as al almost equally or a little bit maybe less which would then compensate for your being at home yes. with your family. And we gain by added competencies, added experience, added exposure sure. when they come with those skills. Yes, definitely. Uh, one other thing that uh, caught my eye is this lot of the city hotels and hotels now here have foreign GMs, quite a bit of them. Mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't that be a good opportunity for our experienced people to come back and fill those places? Yes. Or? I think uh, I'm, I'm actually very sorry to say this. We have a foreign phobia. Right. Uh, and that could be one of the reasons why our experienced people go abroad. Now, if you take the Maldives, most of the 90% of the hotels, the general managers are Sri Lankans mm. or the department heads. And in top class luxury hotels like the, even the Four Seasons, the Ritz, the Car, uh, uh, Ritz Carlton's, the Shangri-La's, uh, so, uh, in the early days when we started tourism, it was very well managed for in employment in Sri Lanka. Which means if a hotel invested, like we had the Intercontinental at the time, the Lanka Oberoi, those were the two major hotel chains that started. Uh, the rule was that you can have only so many foreigners, general manager and two or three others. Right. And for each of those, you have to have an understudy of Sri Lanka. And within a space of the time that they leave, you have to have a Sri Lankan taking over. Of course, the GM sometimes continues as a representative of the management company. company. But some even, some chains like the Ramada, I remember, did away with that and started recruiting uh, Sri Lankans for the GM's role. But now I think it has gone a bit out of control. For example, one hotel has 22 expatriates now in the city. Right. So, this also de deprives our graduates who pass out going into those positions who may be equally good. So, there should be a crime. And in the old days, if somebody wanted to hire an expat, we had to advertise in the newspaper, show proof that there are no Sri Lankans available yeah, for this for position. Yes. Then only the expat visa was approved. And even if it was approved, the time frame was given to replace with the Sri Lanka. And that was primarily 
confined to international hotel chains, not even big local hotels. But now you see everywhere in the country, you find foreigners being employed, uh, even at hostess level yes. uh, or reception level or GRO level. It's good to bring in a foreign flavor, all that, but it should not be at the expense of our local people, Very true. I which am. we train and who are even better most of the time than the foreigners. Uh, does this mean that the original rule has been done away with? Uh, no, Chanaka, the rule is there, but it's a question of implementation. Why is it we not implemented? We are not implementing it to the letter. Right. Maybe again to encourage foreign investments and you know, all of that, uh, if you come with so much of investment, you can bring so many foreigners to the country to work and all of that. Right. But there should be a balance between the two. Otherwise, we will find our people getting frustrated and continuing to uh, work abroad. And that and will also uh, form uh, work as a damp for the ambitious ones who think they can never get yeah. to this post because there's already... Yeah. Now, for example, Shangri-La Hambantota has a Sri Lankan yeah. who has been working abroad for a long time. And we have many Sri Lankans in senior jobs uh, who, who can always come back here and fit into senior roles. But we, with due respect, there are five-star hotel chains in Colombo who have now uh, uh, have uh, local GMs, like the Hilton, for example. Uh, I was a GM at the Kingsbury. Uh, of course, I was replaced by a foreigner. Uh, but I launched the hotel after the rebranding, and I think we had a successful 14 months uh, uh, to, uh, where, where the hotel really took off. Right. Yes, that is, I think, uh, something that actually the industry has to take a very careful look at uh, having a limit on the people who come in. I think because especially as you say, the, as not at the expense of a locally trained person. If there are no locals available, fine. Yeah, that is so a, the Hotels Association also should look at this problem and take appropriate uh, steps. Step. Only in the interest of retaining our trained staff without allowing them to go abroad. Yes, I think staff retention is a big problem because even uh, people like ILO are now talking about uh, retaining staff in all sectors. Yes. Uh, one final question, uh, Mr. Sanayak, I would like to ask is, from here, where do you think we can go? I mean, how much further can we take this uh, training of uh, the industry people from this country as a, uh, uh, a main place in the region? How far can we go? I think it's limitless. For example, at SLITHM, uh, again, before I uh, relinquish my role, one year ago, we launched the finance, hospitality finance professional course. That is for people who are already in the finance industry, uh, finance professionals, and also who are newly passed out as finance people, but who want to specialize in hotel accounting. We launched that program together with the chartered management accountants, and it's been very, very successful. Then we had plans to launch a uh, uh, sommelier's program. Sommelier means uh, wine Mentes. specialist, which we lack very much. Uh, there are reasons for that, primarily because we find it difficult to pronounce the names of the wines, so we lack confidence in those. So lots of things. Hotels have these marvelous wine displays, investing so much money, but actual sale of the wine is not even it's one bottle per day. day. Right. So that is due to lack of confidence, lack of knowledge. So we, w we, ha we wanted to start a three-month certificate course in sommeliering, three-month certificate course in butler, uh, butlering because we have a lot of these boutique hotels which give a very personalized, specialized service to the customer from the time they check in till you check out. You have one person like at home attending on you. Uh, so butler uh, and sommelier and also the concierge. Uh, when we were traveling once in Italy and we went to Venice and in this hotel I saw these guys wearing the lapel pins of a, a concierge association. So I got the contacts from there. When I came back to Sri Lanka, when I was at the Kingsbury, I gave it, we made contact and now there is a concierge association of that global concierge as a branch in Sri Lanka as a result. So there is also the learning opportunity for our concierge. Concierge are people who work at the front office who has everything on their fingertips that a customer would want to know. 
booking uh, theater tickets to doing anything. So that's again a specialized job. So that also you need to be trained. So we had plans for these three courses, which I hope uh, my predecessors will launch for sommeliering, uh, concierge, and uh, butlering. And also we wanted to start a culinary school, a specialized within the SLITHM, specialized courses in culinary skills. We do professional cookery courses, everybody learns and they, they are very good in that. But once they have gained that professional cookery experience, then to go to the, to the next level of becoming a culinary expert. So actually it is limitless what you can do. It's what is required is thinking, planning, and the resources. Right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Disanayaka. Uh, your uh, input onto the, into this uh, interview was extremely useful and very enlightening and it's very encouraging to know that there's so much scope in this industry now and for the future. Uh, so I again thank you for the time you spent with You're us. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you. Uh, That concludes our interview for today. Uh, till we meet again. Uh, from our TV.